Good evening. I'm Julia, a bookseller at Politics and Prose, and I'd like to welcome you to PNP Live, bringing you the authors you love and the new books you crave. Thank you for joining us in our virtual format during extraordinary times. At any point during tonight's discussion, you can click the link on the side of the screen to purchase Jennifer Taub's Big Dirty Money on Politics and Prose's website. If you have a question for Jennifer and our panel, you can use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though apologies in advance if we don't have time to address yours this evening. Before we begin, we wanna sincerely thank you for being with us this evening. We are so thankful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Jennifer Taub is a legal scholar and advocate devoted to making complex business law topics engaging inside and outside of the classroom. Her research and writing focus on corporate governance, banking and financial market regulation, and white collar crime. Moderating the discussion is Julie Zebrak, who will now introduce our panel of experts. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Julia. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I'm so excited that y'all are here. I'm so excited to introduce Jennifer and to um, be a part of this evening where we um, talk about something that, that really is timely. And so let me welcome you. Let me introduce the book. Big Dirty Money, The Shocking Injustice and Unseen Cost of White Collar Crime. It was published last Tuesday with Viking Press, a division of Penguin Random House. For those of you who don't know Jennifer, she has become a friend over the last couple of years, um, a Twitter friend, a political friend, and a real friend. Um, Jennifer is a law professor and an authority on the 2008 mortgage meltdown and related fin financial crisis. Her research and writing centers on follow the money matters, promoting transparency and opposing corruption. She was co-founder and organizer of the April 15, 2017 tax march where more than 120,000 people gathered in cities nationwide to demand President Trump release his tax returns. After she reads briefly from the book for us this evening, Jennifer will guide a discussion about the book between our expert panelists, who I'm also thrilled to introduce to all of you. We have Jesse Isinger, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, ProPublica editor, and author of the book, The Chicken Shit Club. We have Barb McQuaid, former US attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, MSNBC legal expert, and University of Michigan law professor. We have Ellie Mistal, the Justice Correspondent for The Nation. And we have Joyce Vance, the former U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama, MSNBC expert, and University of Alabama law professor. Before I pass the mic to Jen, I'd like to share with you what James Stewart wrote for the New York Times about Big Dirty Money. Top explicitly and persuasively places the breakdown of enforcement and accountability in the context of money and class. And while Donald Trump is not the ostensible subject of big dirty money, Jennifer Taub's polemic against America's failure to curb the destructive criminal tendencies of the very rich, the president, his friends, and former Trump campaign and administration officials parade through these pages. So, we're ready, we're excited. Jennifer, let's kick, let's have you kick us off. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and thank all, thank you to uh, Politics and Pros and all the panelists here tonight. I appreciate all of you and I'm really looking forward to this. My plan is to read <clears throat> very briefly from the book, just around two minutes or so. And then we're, I'm going to um, turn to our panelists, starting with Barb McQuaid, um, because she, is a little shy around the camera and I just wanna make sure she gets, get, goes first. But um, also because she's from my home state of Michigan and my blood does bleed blue and gold. So here we go. I'm reading from the preface, um, which is entitled Crime Scene. Big cheaters often prosper and they do it right in front of our faces. You can see them almost daily on the front page of the newspaper in your Twitter feed, 
and on broadcast and cable news programs. Rogues to riches stories are common now. Cheating the public and getting away with it is the new normal. Turn on the television today and you're more likely to see wealthy, well-connected white men secure presidential pardons than watch one get convicted and sent to prison. Just after Valentine's Day in 2020, President Donald Trump granted clemency to a slew of affluent felons. Their offenses, bribery, investment fraud, tax evasion, Medicare fraud, public corruption, computer hacking, and extortion cover-up, money laundering, conspiracy to defraud the federal government, obstruction of justice, mail fraud, wire fraud. No white collar crime left behind. The official White House announcement used the word successful four times to describe these elite outlaws, but made no mention of the ordinary, ordinary people they victimized. We also have a double standard in the American criminal justice system that reflects and perpetuates inequality. Cutting legal corners is a tool for advancement only available to the already affluent. The wealthy not only increase their power by evading punishment, but also benefit from a criminal justice system that incarcerates those with lower social status who also attempt to use crime to get ahead. Selling loose cigarettes on a New York City sidewalk can lead to a chokehold arrest and death. Eric Garner, a middle-aged black man was surrounded by police officers, tackled and suffocated for what was just a small time tax dodge. Garner was selling cigarettes purchased cheaper by the pack out of state and selling them one by one to passersby. Tax evasion, depriving New York state and city of nearly $5.85 per pack. The Department of Justice decided not to prosecute the police officer who killed Garner. The reasoning? The powers that be believed he had not used excessive force under the circumstances. Racism is baked into that conclusion. Can you imagine cops circling, tackling, and choking a white woman who was poised to drop her fraudulent tax return in a city mailbox? How would that not be considered excessive force? In the last passage, Donald Trump was not the first privileged American to use apparent unlawful behavior to gain and sustain power and wealth, and then to use that wealth to gain immunity from further offenses. What makes him unique though, is how high he climbed. During his campaign, transition, inauguration, and while in office, he has surrounded himself with comrades, some of whom reportedly got rich off of shady practices and siphoning government funds. Some have been convicted and are now in prison. Others remain untouchable, either for lack of trying or due to legal loopholes. It's hard to envision a future where justice catches up with him. But for now, let's imagine a world where the government had held Donald John Trump accountable for those many offenses he apparently committed well before he launched his presidential campaign in 2015. As Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist Jesse Isinger has observed, that's a world where President Trump is an impossibility. It's within our power to create that world where he and anyone like him is an impossibility. The damage already done by our 45th president demonstrates the dangers we face if we fail to do so. Okay, so with that, um, I'm, I'm going to turn off my mic and hand it over to Barb, who will, um, who will talk about her own experience as a federal prosecutor and provide many insights for us. Thank you, Barb. Well, thanks very much, Jen. And uh, thank you to Julie and Julia for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm honored to be with all the, the other panelists. And Jen, congratulations on the book. It's really terrific. Uh, I think you have articulated uh, a lot of impressions I've had over the years, but have not been able to identify and name and chronicle in the way that you have. So I think it's a really important book. 
And I hope that your uh, recommendations will be taken seriously by people who care about law and order. Uh, we hear people who um, demand law and order who I think are thinking about one system of justice, but not as you so eloquently put it, the other system of justice and that we have these double standards in our system. I have seen it for years as a prosecutor. I wanted to focus on this chapter you call Forgiveness for the Fortunate, which talks about sentencing of white collar criminals. But first I wanted to just mention a couple of other things um, in the book that are so important. One is you've got a chapter called Victims in the Shadows. And you talk about so-called victimless crime. You know, we think of uh, crime as existing solely of, of street crime, of violent crime. And yet we see so much harm done by white collar defendants, very privileged people. And we don't take stock of these harms. Things like people who invest their life savings with uh, fraudulent investors and lose all of it. When people uh, violate environmental laws and contribute to air pollution that leads to death uh, and illness. Those people just don't get noticed or counted. Uh, people who end up addicted to opioids because of uh, families like the Sackler family or owners of pharmaceutical companies who push these drugs on unsuspecting people, uh, consumers who are cheated. All of these people are the victims of so-called victimless crimes. And so it's difficult to quantify it and measure it but it exists and it is a, a, a powerful harm that exists in our society. The other um, chapter that you um, is really interesting is one you call Suspicious Minds, where you talk about how difficult it can be to prove criminal intent in some of these white collar crime cases. And you highlight some of the things that happened in the uh, post 2008 banking scandals, where there was uh, a, lot, a lot of statements about, well, we just couldn't prove criminal intent and so, people seem to get away with highway robbery because of that. I was just teaching mens rea in my class today. I teach first year criminal law. And we were talking about how certain kinds of crimes, a very rare subset requires this higher level of criminal intent of willfulness. That is you must prove not only that they did the thing that was illegal, not only that they knew they did the thing that was illegal, but they knew that the thing they did um, was a crime. And you know, examples I gave tax cases, export violations, campaign finance violations. And one of the students raised his hand, he said, oh, you mean rich people crimes. And so I thought he made your point extremely well, yes. And the law is really skewed in ways that make it more difficult to prosecute people uh, for these white collar crimes by requiring this higher level of intent. And so I think you expose it beautifully. But the part I wanted to focus on was this chapter, Forgiveness for the Fortunate about sentencing. And um, I thought you really brought this home with some examples and something I have seen in my own practice so many times. Um, there are defense attorneys who will come in uh, when a white collar defendant has been convicted of a crime and ask a judge for leniency and for mercy. And one of the arguments you often hear is, your honor, my client has already been punished enough just by being charged. The shame that this person has felt in the community has been greater than any punishment you could impose upon him by sending him to prison. Why he can't even walk through his country club without seeing some sort of dirty look. Oh, God forbid. You know, do you think that the, the street drug dealer is making that argument? You know, absolutely not. And so uh, just it starts from this position of such privilege. And what's so frightening about it is it actually seems to work from time to time. You can see the judge, you know, starting to nod. And I think a big part of it is judges see their peers in these white collar uh, criminals as people who, you know, look like me, uh, there but for the grace of God go I. And so sometimes these arguments actually resonate. Um, another thing that you see in these white collar cases is both at trial and in sentencing, the submission of scores of character witnesses, people who can say that this person has contributed so many good works to society that the judge should take that into consideration when imposing sentence. They've done all of this community service. They've made donations to charitable causes. There's a wing at the hospital named after him because he donated millions of dollars. Again, that is two systems of justice. Do you think that the, you know, the, the person who's selling drugs on the street uh, or committed the petty crime has the ability to point to all their good works or all the time they've devoted to volunteer work? Absolutely not. And so the idea that we take all of that so seriously in mitigating the sentence speaks of two systems of justice. Um, and then finally, so often we see judges second guessing and imposing their own will on sentencing guidelines. In the federal system, there are sentencing guidelines that are used to calculate 
the presumed offense. A judge can go above or below that if they think that there's something about this case that makes it unique, but typically they will start with and impose a sentence within the sentencing guidelines. It takes into consideration characteristics of the offender, of the offense, and the person's criminal history. And yet you will often hear uh, a judge say, the guidelines in this case are just too high. You'll hear that frequently in a white collar case. As you quote, Jennifer, in um, the Paul Manafort case, Judge Ellis said that, oh, these guidelines are just too high and I'm going to impose a sentence below the guidelines. You don't hear that in drug cases. You don't hear that in street crime cases. You don't hear that in violent crime cases. It's only in these white collar cases where the defendants say, those guidelines are just too high and I'm going to reduce it. Or this is his first offense ever and I'm going to reduce the sentence accordingly. The guidelines already factor in a person's criminal history. And so that is like a double counting of mitigation. And so I'll wrap it up there, but I just think you very um, eloquently and thoroughly chronicle the ways there are two systems of justice. And on, we have focused a lot on perhaps a system that is too harsh on people who commit street crimes, which are a product, I think, of lack of opportunity and hopelessness. But I think we've not focused enough on the thing you focus on, which is the privilege and the benefits that are given to white collar defendants whose crimes are not a product, product of hopelessness and lack of opportunity, but a product of greed. And so I am grateful that you have shined a light on this problem and I'm hopeful that policymakers in perhaps the next administration will see fit to treat these crimes as seriously as you do. Thank you so much, Barb. It means so much coming from you. And I'm, I'm really glad that you are um, teaching mens rea right now in, in criminal law. Um, I think it's, it's so complicated and I still don't understand it. That is gonna be my next focus to a deep dive into that. Um, and Joyce, it's your turn to talk next and I hope you've calmed the chickens that are now in your office. I do have four baby chickens. I hope you cannot hear them peeping. They are um, a little bit loud at the moment, but fingers crossed. So I'll pick up where Barb left off. Um, and first, Jen, I just have to congratulate you on this book. It reads like a novel. I actually had difficulty putting it down, which doesn't usually happen when I'm reading law books. Um, maybe it's just because the subject rings so closely to home for me, but it really is fabulous. And I appreciate very much that the folks at Politics and Prose and that Julie and Julia have included me um, in this opportunity. So Barb and I have similar backgrounds. We're often confused for each other, in fact. And we've both had this same experience of prosecuting public corruption cases. But I wanna start with where I lived in a life before I was the US attorney in Birmingham. I was actually the appellate chief in my office. And I had the experience of arguing a series of sentencing cases where something very unusual happened, where the Solicitor General actually gave us permission to appeal sentences because the judges had issued a series of sentences to four cooperating co-defendants, all former CEOs of this entity called Health South that was ripping off its investors and its employees, people who had worked there their whole career, had no pension by the time this fraud was done. And, and the judges were giving these people for the reasons that Bard talks about, non-custodial sentences. Well, those sentences were illegal. These were class B felonies. They had to require uh, some time in prison. And so we were sort of, uh, the Solicitor General doesn't like for you to appeal stuff, but in this case, it had to happen. And so it became my habit to drive from Birmingham to Atlanta to the 11th Circuit to argue one of these cases every couple of months. And in one of them, sort of a moment that I think has scarred me to this day, and that's maybe one of the reasons I enjoyed Jen's book so much, I looked at a judge who I, who I really like and who I know very well, and I said to him, judge, and it was the second appeal, he, the defendant originally gets no custody. We go back. The judge gives him four months. It's still not enough. I convinced the Solicitor General to let me appeal again. And I look the judge in the eye and I say, judge. This is a ridiculous downwards departure from the guidelines. If this was a, a, a young defendant who was selling crack cocaine, you would never consider a, a departure like this to be appropriate. And he looked at me and he said, Miss Vance, I, I'm not interested in, in that comparison. This is a completely different defendant and different kind of crime. 
And it was sort of a soul sucking moment for me, to be honest, because I thought about this man who so much had been given to him. He had thrown a huge party down at the beach, his send off for his four months to prison custodial sentence. He could have done that time standing upside down because he had made so much money in the fraud that the government never fully recovered. You maybe can tell that I have a little bit of animosity here towards these defendants, but certainly as a prosecutor, I viewed these cases as being extremely serious and I'm a huge fan of a smart on crime approach, which says that federal prosecutors shouldn't be in the business of picking the low hanging fruit. You know, we should be leaving cases that are small drug cases or that are essentially small dollar amount frauds for our colleagues in the state system to do. In many ways, they have better statutory capabilities to do those crimes. But when we're talking about hardcore public corruption, and that's the chapter of Jen's book that I want to focus on, when we're in that realm of public of, uh, corruption, of people who are taking advantage essentially of us as taxpayers and, and money that we pay in, those are the core crimes that federal prosecutors should be doing. They take a lot longer, they're more difficult, they don't always pan out as we see in Jen's book from the discussion. But you know, these are important matters and, and we should never shy away from doing them. Unfortunately, the courts over the last 15 years have very much narrowed federal prosecutors ability to prosecute these cases. And this is a part of Jen's book that is so compelling. Um, I would encourage you to buy the book if for no other reason than for the public corruption chapter. But she traces the story of Virginia Governor McDonnell, who's doing crazy stuff. I mean, his wife gets, it, it starts at the inaugural um, meeting where his wife actually wants to accept a, a donation of $20,000 to help her buy a ball gown. And the governor's legal advisor waves them off and says, no, you can't do that. But apparently that advice goes out the window because they then do everything from Rolex watches to wedding expenses, to vacation, to Ferrari driving. I mean, it's just sort of an open grift relationship. And in exchange, the governor is promoting the business of, of the man who's essentially corrupting him. It's a really compelling story. Unfortunately, the government's hard fought conviction gets reversed on appeal. And it's part of this um, really a line of cases where the Supreme Court, mostly in decisions that have been unanimous, tells federal prosecutors, no, you've gone too far. And perhaps the most recent one, the June decision in the Bridgegate case, you all remember Chris Christie's chief of staff cut off um, what had been three lanes of traffic that were designated for a New Jersey township to get into Manhattan in the mornings because the mayor of that town wouldn't support Governor Christie in his reelection bid. And so his chief of staff, ironically named Bridget, says, hey, let's just go ahead and cut off access to the bridge and it'll be a disaster and we'll pay him back for it. And so this is sort of where all of this ends up. And, and the court says, well, you know, it, it's political uh, sort of retaliation, but it's not a property fraud. And so again, the government's conviction gets reversed. And, and what this makes me think of is a case that's been in the news a lot lately because Rod Blagojevich, the Illinois governor who was convicted for yet another fraud, had his sentence commuted by um, President Trump recently. And so that case sort of popped back into our consciousness after he had served eight years on a 14 sentence. But some of his conviction counts were reversed. And the Supreme Court said, you know, political log rolling, that's just not a crime. We can't make that be a crime. This notion that he wanted to trade a Senate seat that, he, that Governor Blagojevich had the ability to appoint for and that he wanted to parlay that into a cabinet position himself, that's not a crime. That's just politics as usual. And the court says in passing, we can't make this a crime because if we did, there would be stuff going on every day that would be a crime. So I would encourage you to read Jen's book. I think we're at an important juncture in our history where instead of these casual opportunistic crimes um, that we've seen in these three cases that I've mentioned, we're looking at a sustained at a systematic effort 
to defraud taxpayers. And the question is whether or not our laws fit the situation we now find ourselves in, whether they've really been a good fit for the last 15 years as we've watched mounting public corruption go unaddressed by the legal system. And yes, I'm compelled by the Supreme Court when they say in the Bridgegate case that the way to address this is either with state prosecutions or at the ballot box. But nonetheless, as a federal prosecutor, I'd like to see uh, our laws mean anything or mean something. And um, Jen, thanks so much for addressing this and taking this on. Like Barb, I hope that the next uh, group of folks at DOJ will take your book very seriously. Okay, I did that embarrassing thing of not unmuting. Um, thank you so much, Joyce. And next up will be um, Ellie Mistal. Um, when we first met several years ago, we had this idea that, or at least I had this idea, right, Ellie, that we would have a podcast called Law and Disorder. Um, and that never came to be, but um, we often get a chance to chat with each other. And I look forward to hearing, um, hearing your comments about this and honestly, really anything, Ellie. So if you want to just like talk about anything, I'm sure everyone wants to hear from you. That works. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jen, for having me. Thank you guys for including me in this. Um, in my current life um, as the nation justice correspondent, I cannot recommend this book enough. I cannot recommend the prescriptions and ideas in this book enough as a way to kind of rein in our corporate greed and malfeasance and rein in, especially as Joyce was just saying, um, our public corruption laws. But I wasn't always the justice correspondent of the nation. In fact, in my former, former, former life, um, I was a big law attorney. Well, not attorney, I was never actually barred. That's a whole different story. Um, but <laughs> I worked for a giant law firm that did defense work um, for these kinds of white collar criminals and, and corporations um, that are surfaced in Jen's book. I think I'm the only person here who can say that I had their Christ my Christmas ruined by Elliot Spitzer. You know, I worked in, in big law at a time where the most dangerous space in New York was between Elliot Spitzer and a camera. Um, and, and, this was, and, and this was my life for, for, for a couple of years, defending these corporations. So when I was reading Jen's book, I couldn't help. It was like every time I tried to get out, they dragged me back in. Like I couldn't help remembering all the little tricks and, and feints and things that we used to say and do to help get our clients off of these, uh, from these prosecutions. And so I, that's kind of where I want to start with and what I want to think about um, with, with, with Professor Taub's book. One of our biggest tricks, if you it's not really a trick, one of our biggest things was the locked fact that you cannot find these companies enough to make it not worth them doing the, the crime, right? Like our, our fines for insider training and tax evasion and all these kinds of issues, they just don't, the, the, the corporate bean counters have counted it out and figured out that they are more likely than not to make a profit from pushing the law, stretching the law, bending the law as far as it goes, because even if they get caught, even if they get um, convicted, the fines that they're looking at are incredibly low compared to the profits that they're able to generate. In fact, one of their biggest concerns is how much I cost, right? How much the lawyers cost to defend from those crimes, not the actual what the government's going to do in terms of uh, uh, finding them, right? So, so that's that's one problem where where I don't think people always appreciate just the scale of profits in play when it comes to some of these crimes. That's why people do it. Second thing that people don't always understand is the asymmetry between the legal fire that these large corporations have and our federal reg regulators and prosecutors. And that's mind bending for people because we all understand, like if I'm if I'm a low level street crime, you know, kind of person, if I'm a car, you know, thief, if I'm a, if I'm a cat burglar and Barbara McQuaid walks into my house and Joyce Vance walks, I'm in trouble, right? Like I, have, like I do not have the resources to fight them kind of toe to toe, right? But if attorney Vance or attorney McQuaid walks into Citibank, walks into Shell, walks into one of these global conglomerates um, that we have in this country, they are the ones who are at a disadvantage. 
because it is the corporations that are able to put lawyer after lawyer after man after hour after man hour against the federal government. In fact, it is the lawyers for the corporations that because they can put this so much manpower in, actually understand the crime sometimes better than the prosecutors themselves. Like a lot of times I will be in, I have been in situations in a room with like, you know, 10 defense attorneys and 10 prosecutors, and there's only one prosecutor even has a clue what they're talking about. Compare, you know, because the, the kind of crime, the way that they've done this particular version of insider trading, whatever, it's actually super complicated, right? And they, and they don't have the resources and the staff to kind of match the defense attorneys toe for toe for toe for toe. That, that creates an asymmetry that it's hard for the government to overcome. So even when the government is kind of in the right and has them dead to rights, it has all the evidence, it's a very easy for the corporations to, I don't want to say get away with it, but get away with it without what's called in the business, bet the company litigation, right? Because you do you really want to take down Citibank? Do you really want to take down Blackwater, a huge head fund? Are you really, do you really have the stamina to do that? Or do you want to put some person in jail for four months, you know, find them a million dollars or whatever, um, and then move on with your life? And that's, that is the offer that the corporations are constantly making to the prosecutors. Hey, we can, this could be over. You don't have to be at your office until midnight every night. Like we, we can just end this right now, four months and a million dollars. Let's go, right? So like that, that's one thing to understand. The third thing, and, and you know, Jen's book does such a good job of talking about the class and the, the class of these people and how all of these people are part of the same, you know, kind of stratosphere. That, that, is so, that is so true, right? So like once, you know, I don't come from this class and I wasn't born into this class, but once I was able to educate myself into this class, um, once I was able to educate myself into these, you know, bars and back rooms and whiskey joints and cigar bar. Do you know there's still a thing called a cigar bar? Like New York City, right? You can't smoke at any bar because it's bad, unless it's a cigar bar, in which case you can just go in a back room and hang out with like Giuliani. Like it's, it, it, it is a closed circle of people who are all kind of fighting around the same trough. And that comes through in so many different ways. So one thing that I wanted to read is section 1701. That's the US tax code um, um, uh, uh, penalty for insider trade, trading, right? Uh, sorry, penalty for tax evasion. Kind of comes up because Donald Trump may have been doing tax avoidance, may have been doing tax evasion. Let me read how, how just wide open this is. Any person who willfully attempts in any manner to evade or defeat any tax imposed by this title um, or payment thereof, in addition to other penalties provided by law, should be guilty of a felony and some fines. Now, I read that because that is so broad that what ends up happening is that prosecutors kind of only go after you for tax evasion if they hate you, or they're going after you for something else and they want to throw in some tax evasion charges. Because tax evasion is so broad, basically anybody wealthy, certainly any corporation, is gonna end up doing some low-grade tax evasion. I mean, like, any defeat any tax? Well, the difference between defeating a tax and getting out of a tax is so thin that it almost breaks meaning, right? And so what you have is kind of a perverse incentive for corporations to play very, very, very nice with prosecutors because they know at any point. They can be busted for tax evasion. At any point, they can be busted for insider trading because the laws are so wide open. Why not, right? So if you piss one of them off too much, you might catch yourself a lawsuit. So it actually, so understand how that incentivizes being super nice to the prosecutors who are then supposed to turn around and hold you accountable for financial crimes when the time comes. It's, it's an incestuous system. It's not great. There are many prosecutors who are you know honorable decent great super people and there are some who want to work at the bank in two seconds there are some who got there from working at the big firm right you know a lot of people who worked at my old firm Devin Boys, went on to work in the SDNY's office and then left to go back to be partners at Devin Boys. there's a bit of a revolving door there it engenders a situation where you don't want to be where it, it doesn't 
it's hard to go from that. Let me put it like this. It's hard to go from that situation to, I think you should be in jail for 10 years for the rest of, you know, I think you should lose your house and your family. Like it, it's hard to make that, that turn um, in our system. So what do we do? Again, a lot of the suggestions in Jen's book are great, but I, I, I just always want people to be aware that there are laws that we could write that would fix these things. Like regulation is not something that sits on high and can be only accessed by like the very smart, like we could have politicians write better regulations to make some of these issues that we have in our financial systems and our policy, uh, our, our, our polity at large, more punishable, easier to punish, all these kinds of things. And I'll just close exactly where, where Joyce ended. The Bridgegate thing to me is so obvious because I was on, again, from my defense lawyer days, I was on team free Bridget Kelly. Bridget Kelly in the Bridgegate saga is the woman who wrote time for some traffic problems in Fort Lee. She clearly was one of the people who executed Chris Christie's corrupt scheme. But I just said something that's not legally provable. Chris Christie's corrupt scheme. Because I do not believe in a world in which that bridge gets closed without Chris Christie's know-how or say-so. I can't prove that. I can never prove that because the prosecutors never tried. The prosecutors never went after Christie. Christie was not in was not indicted or charged in Bridgegate. Now, how is that? How is that? And the reason why that is is because our public corruption laws are so weak. If we want to change that we can write laws to change that. And if we can get people like Chris Christie, we don't have to go after people like Bridget Kelly. Thank you so much. I feel like clapping or something. Um, yeah, I, I, have, um, I have so many comments about, Freedom! especially, <laughs> yeah, about, about rewriting in particular the honest services wire fraud statute, we could do better. And so let's like put our heads together and get in, get really nerdy about that. Um, okay, so now last but not least, Jesse. Jesse, um, you don't care about the revolving door at all, do you? Uh, no, of course, uh, not something I've ever thought about. Uh, well, uh, I don't know why I agreed to go after Ellie. That was uh, that was such a great performance. I think we should just move on. But uh, I'm really grateful to be part of this panel and flattered to be part of uh, this group. And uh, congratulations, Jen, on the book. It's a marvelous achievement and incredibly important. And uh, I have uh, tried to contribute to this literature. And one of the things that I didn't really do is outline solutions to this. And what I was hoping was that uh, people who had more expertise than I, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, I play a lawyer on occasional Zooms, but I'm actually just a journalist. And um, what I was hoping is that the legal community would pick up the mantle and try to think about solutions here. And I think that is one of the great not the only, but one of the great contributions of your book is to really kind of add to the solutions here. Um, and I wanna congratulate you on that. I think that Barb and Joyce and Ellie have outlined a series of significant problems with the law, but I guess I would go a little bit further than everyone um, here tonight to say that what we're, we've sort of grounded the issues in this conversation so far has been grounded in a basically a pre-Trump, um, pre-Bill Barr era DOJ conversation, where we have essentially discussed uh, the problems with the judiciary in going soft on white collar criminals. We've discussed a kind of elite affinity at the prosecutorial level. Um, and it's something that I uh, identified and other people have identified. Um, you know, the SDNY today really is, you should really think of the elite offices of the Department of Justice like the SDNY or Maine Justice or EDBA and a collection of others as um, a training ground for future corporate defense lawyers. Um, and that is a broken system. And that is really a corrupt system. There's a kind of soft corruption. Um, and I would categorize that as perhaps a kind of elite democratic corruption. Um, and now what we've seen in the last few years is something 
starkly different and order of magnitude different and worse uh, kind of destruction of the rule of law. Um, so the Department of Justice is no longer, uh, it's no longer a question of whether they have the right white collar priorities and whether they're putting enough resources into it or whether they're approaching it correctly. And I have a series of uh, recommendations for that. And you have a series, Jen, uh, recommendations like investing in the IRS, which I agree with, and just basically categorizing and keeping track of white collar crime um, and investing in uh, prosecutorial efforts and focusing um, DOJ resources on this. I agree with all that. And uh, I think the big issue, the big solution is to focus away from corporate settlements because uh, Elliot exactly identified the big problem, which is that corporations can pay whatever it takes to get out of it and it's become a cost of doing business and you need to get away from all these settlements with corporations. They're called deferred prosecution agreements. They're called non-prosecution agreements. Sometimes you secure a guilty plea from a company, but really it's meaningless. And what you need to do is refocus on prosecuting executives to the top uh, as far as you can go, the highest echelons of the corporation. But what I think the Trump administration has proven are two things. One is that the critics of white collar prosecution have dramatically underestimated the problem and that this wasn't a problem simply of corporations running rampant um, but and not just public corruption, but whole swaths of the economy were relatively unpoliced, like high-end real estate and campaign finance and corporate uh, uh, and uh, campaign finance and uh, corporate lobbying, um, all things that we've seen prosecuted in a kind of piecemeal effort uh, in the Trump administration. Um, but what you're really seeing here from Barr is the transformation of the Department of Justice into a weapon that attacks enemies and a shield to protect friends. Um, and that is at the base, uh, using the apparatus of the state towards political ends um, is a destruction of the rule of law. And so I think what we are doing here is seeing here and facing here is an enormous crisis. Uh, I think, um, and maybe this is kind of recency bias or because I'm relatively young, but it seems like a, the greatest crisis that our democracy has faced, certainly um, in generations. And uh, what we need to do is uh, a reclamation project, a government reclamation project. And that would require uh, rebuilding the IRS, rebuilding the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, and rebuilding the Department of Justice. It's gonna take years, it's gonna take money, it's gonna take will. Um, and uh, I'm not optimistic that it can be done, uh, but I hope it will be. So I will uh, leave it at that and uh, we can open it up for questions. Oh, I agree with so much of what you said, Jesse. Uh, certainly coming from the Department of Justice and, and working on uh, resources and administrative pieces of this, uh, you can't get this done without the resources. Um, and so building back DOJ and, and IRS and, and other parts of the government is going to be key. Uh, I want to open us up to questions. You all um, have hit so many good highlights um, that I feel like we shouldn't even have any questions at this point. Um, but we do. We have a handful. And uh, let's start with Ed, who is asking, um, and this is um, for Jen and, and Jennifer and for probably all of you, um, do we think that if white collar criminals receive longer prison sentences or in fact, any prison sentences, there'd be fewer white collar crimes? So I think the answer to that, um, you know, as any lawyer would say, it depends. It depends how we define uh, white collar crime. If we think about white collar crime in the way that the man, Edwin Sutherland, who coined the term thought of it, um, and he, then I think there would be. But if we treat white collar crime um, the way we, there's a tendency to treat it today, I'm not sure that that would work. So Edwin Sutherland had, had coined the term in 1939 to focus on more um, of the status of the offender instead of the nature of the offense. 
So in other words, a white collar criminal in his mind was someone who committed a crime, a, a person who had um, hi, uh, high social status and respectability, who committed a crime in the course of his occupation. Today, because we're lawyers, we, we think of white collar crime as the offense we can point to, the statute, you know, it's 18 USC 1001 or it's 18 USC 371. I'm speaking code for my lawyer friends here. In other words, it's the fal false statement statute or it's the conspiracy statute. And the problem is if we go after the people, Joyce was saying, the low hanging fruit for white collar crime, whether we're doing it at the federal or state level, that's just gonna perpetuate the same kind of inequality and the same kind of anger in criminal justice. So, you know, when the Department of Justice goes after the guy, um, Yates, uh, or I'm sorry, the guy, not Yates, Yates was the uh, AG and I, but when the DOJ goes after the guy who throws fish overboard um, under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, it makes people scratch their head. That's not gonna be all that effective in stopping accounting fraud, right? On the other hand, if the DOJ did what Sally Yates recommended when she updated the prosecution manual um, and said, you know, no, no more of these DPAs and NPAs, these deferred prosecution and non-prosecutions, um, unless you actually turn in the high level people, um, the individuals, then that will work. And I know I'm going on and on, but sort of one more thing, unfortunately, when Rod Rosenstein um, took over, this kind of speaks to what Jesse said about undermining the rule of law, he went and undermined what um, Sally Yates had done in her role. And he, you know, basically said it, it's just astonishing um, that, you know, yeah, we want to try to hold individual accountable, but we don't need to know everybody's name who is involved at the company, just, you know, just the people who seem like they were closest to the action. And like, I'm not even a prosecutor, and I know that's not going to help you flip anybody. You need to know everybody who was involved because there might be someone low level who knew what was going on, who's a whistleblower, has a good conscience and can turn in the big fish. And this whole new approach um, that Rosenstein put in, um, it, it articulated, isn't going to help us. But I think the answer is yes. If there's if you're likely to get caught, if you're likely to um, serve prison time, then I think the company's leaders would see some downside in, in criminal activity um, instead of it being a cost of doing business. So I'm anti-carceral. I, I really, I, I am very skeptical that more jail leads to better results and leads to less crime. Um, instead, I would quote the great Eddie Murphy from Trading Places. It seems to me that the best way to hurt rich people is to make them poor people. Um, I want to take away people's credit rating, right? Like how, I, how, try to live like a black man with 300 uh, credit rating for five years after your white collar crime. That would, that would change some minds, and I believe, right? I want to, I mean, without joking, I want to take away their money. I want to move them from a mansion to a two bedroom um, apartment on the Lower East Side. Like that, that is what I want to do. I think that unless you can threaten rich people with poverty, they will always figure out a way to game the system so that even if they're in jail, they're in, you know, club fed jail, right? They'll always find a way to game the system to their advantage. But if you take away their cash, if you take away their credit, if you take away their ability to buy and sell things, that that would change some hearts and minds. Uh, I would, uh, I think it's right that you should take away their money to the extent that you can, but I think that prison concentrates the mind like nothing else. And uh, uh, I think that we have been conducting a prison abolition experiment for about 15 years with CEOs. And I, sh I think it uh, shows that it doesn't work, that crime is rampant in the boardroom. And so uh, I am a believer in focusing on prosecuting individuals and trying to bring them to trial and publicizing their bad uh, actions and trying to put some in prison as best you can, um, but to have lower sentences, more CEOs going to prison, but for less time. And I think actually there's a problem is that the few prosecutions that we do have of elite white collar criminals, they overcharge and they put all their chips in and they uh, put people away for many, many, many years, way too long um, the, in a way that does not, it excessively punishes people and actually doesn't really deter white collar crime and also 
uh, doesn't protect society from these criminal actions. And the reason why I believe in prison is that I do think you can deter white collar crime. I think the evidence of deterring street crime by prison is really weak. But the evidence to deter white collar crime with prison is not particularly strong in the academic literature because it really hasn't been studied, but I believe it is strong because people want to preserve their reputation. They have money, they have, they pay attention to the news. And I think that they understand when one of their fraternity goes to prison that that could lead to their uh, jeopardy as well. And so uh, I think that that is a way that you can deter white collar crime. So I want to pull a thread from what Jesse is saying, something that's fascinating to me, and I'm a data person. I think that we should make criminal justice policy on the basis of data. We want to make sure that it works. If we're going to lock people up, we should have principled reasons for doing it, but we should also do it in a smart way, in a way that makes our community better off in the long run. The sentencing guidelines, which is the way people are sentenced to prison, sort of creates a range for sentence in the federal system, are largely created based on at least some loose data. It may not be the best data out there, but it's data-based until you get to the white collar crime area. And there the guidelines are largely unhinged from any data. And to Jesse's point, we don't really know what works. It might in fact be possible to use relatively short two to three year sentences and to achieve deterrence, certainly to incapacitate people so that they can't commit crimes at least for some period of time. But the push that I would make here is for us to marry up the resources so that prosecutors have enough, you know, right now prosecutors frankly can't go after more cases than they're going after lack of resources. And there is a lot of crime out there that doesn't get addressed. It might require a reallocation. Maybe we shouldn't prosecute so many people for the status crime of being present illegally in the country and do more white collar crime and public corruption. You know, I'll leave that up to the next attorney general, but that might be a good idea. But ultimately, um, I do believe that there's a deterrence value to putting people in prison. And at one point in time in my district, we had put our entire county commission in federal prison. And I, I went um, to Atlanta again to argue uh, on appeal, the last one of those convictions. And one of the judges looked at me and he just sort of shook his head and he laughed and he said, Ms. Vance, I believe that the Jefferson County Commission can now hold a full quorum meeting in federal prison. And that was the truth. And we know that people paid attention to that because we still hear sort of these um, echoes of that. A couple of them um, are still there. Most of them have now been released. One passed away earlier this year. But you still hear that sort of echo where people will actually think through the process out loud. Can I do this? Is this legal? I don't want to get in trouble like those people did. So we need better data, but we shouldn't walk too far away from the idea of incarceration for these crimes. Ellie, maybe what your comments point to is the notion that we shouldn't think about white collar crimes in a vacuum, that we should look across the spectrum at the full range of crimes and try to have sentencing guidelines and a sentencing regime that puts all of these crimes into perspective so that the most serious crimes are getting the longest sentence so that all of the sentences reflect the data on what helps us achieve societal goals and so perhaps this is just yet another way of backing into the need for criminal justice reform. So the, those are all so helpful. I think, you know, sort of tying into that, can, I mean, Joyce, you mentioned um, that the, the Jefferson County folks, are there other, other examples? This is a question from Elise, where the courts and government leaders have held wealthy criminals accountable as the norm? I mean, is there a point in time where we can point to where this worked? So, I mean, there are definitely crime ways and crackdowns in the white collar and corporate crime area. And I mean, we can just point to Enron. I mean, there's, there's an upside and then there's maybe the darker side of the story, but um, folks may remember that Andrew Weissman headed up the Enron task force and it was very successful. It wasn't just Enron, but a lot of the accounting frauds of the um, very late 1990s, early 2000s, those folks um, at the highest levels served jail time. And in fact, my own experience, um, shortly after law school, I worked in big law, just like Ellie did. Um, and I never saw the light of day. I worked every weekend and I decided that my dream would come true when I went in house to a company in Connecticut. 
I was a marketing, I was a trade practices um, lawyer. That meant I dealt with business regulation. I wrote sweepstakes rules, you know, no purchase necessary, those rules. And I did, you know, marketing um, law. I was not a securities lawyer at the time. And I went in-house in -house to a company in Connecticut and come to find out a couple of years later, they were cooking the books big time. And uh, they had like the day the news came out in the spring of um, 1998, the stock dropped, the, like the most of a stock had ever dropped in a single day in US history. Um, so that got me really interested in crime and securities laws, by the way. Um, but it turns out our chairman was tried three times. There were two hung juries, and yet the prosecutor went after him a third time. This was Walter Forbes' descendant. Joyce, you might remember, she's smiling, that name. But I guess the point I'm making, um, I could talk about that forever, but I guess the point I'm making, um, making here is that, you know, there was a time and there was a time when people, you know, weren't, as Jesse would say, chicken shit and they would do it. And this was, you know, a time um, when they went after um, the, the leaders. Now, the difference in our case, I think, or this case was that um, by the time these folks got caught, the company had gone through a merger and the new management was trying to push up the old management. And it was convenient that the old managers, you know, um, were foul, you know, criminals, right? I don't know if it would have been the same story if um, it wouldn't have been as easy because it wouldn't have been as easy to turn over the evidence to prosecutors if you were the one turning the evidence over. So you see this a lot. Um, Brandon Garrett, a law professor from Duke who studies um, uh, deferred prosecutions and non-prosecution agreements has a great new paper out where he looks at um, why it is that so infrequently, even if the company settles a criminal case without prosecution and enters into this consent kind of agreement and, and promises to be good boy scouts for a while, that even in those cases, they it's only like around 30% of the time that an executive gets charged. You know, And I know corporations have personhood attributes, but they don't have arms and legs and brains. And there are humans who directed this activity. And I just don't think, I just don't think the Department of Justice should ever enter into a DPA or NPA unless there is someone, and not a low level person who's taken the fall, but the you know, someone high up um, who takes responsibility criminally. So I, I can respond to that, Jennifer, um, having been on the charging end of these things. Um, one of the things, I mean, corporate responsibility is all about diffusing uh, decision making. And so oftentimes people hide behind that corporate structure to say nobody had, you know, no individual had the intent here because they are hiding behind the corporate structure. Um, but I agree with you um, that, and I think the purpose of the Sally Yates memo was to encourage corporations to produce uh, evidence of the wrongdoers. And that's why Rod Rosenstein's pullback of that is really harmful. Um, and, and keep in mind what, that, what, her, what the Yates memo did and didn't do. It didn't say you have to produce this information. It just said, if you wanna get credit for cooperation in our decision whether to charge you or give you a, a DPA or an NPA or some credit in sentencing, if you want that benefit, then in exchange, you have to give us all the information you have about the wrongdoers in your organization. That doesn't seem like too much to ask. If you want this benefit, we do it to individuals. If you want to get credit for cooperation, you have to tell us everything you know about other crimes. And so to scale that back uh, and still get cooperation credit strikes me as really putting your thumb on the scales for the corporation. Now, another thing I will add about DPAs and NPAs, um, I, I tried to stay away from them because I thought it was important to have criminal charges and a felony conviction, even for a non-human uh, corporation that could not go to prison if it was an entity, but could still pay a very sizable fine because I thought the public was entitled to see that felony conviction to understand the significance of the wrongdoing. But there is also something that prosecutors are required to consider under the principles of federal prosecution for business entities. And there were times that because of those principles, I did agree to either a DPA or NPA. And those are things like collateral consequences. We once had a hospital that operated in a rural community that if it were to close, would have a significant negative impact on that community. They would have no other hospital to go to. Similarly, we had a minority owned bank in a minority community where most of the minority citizens did their banking and were deemed too high a credit risk by some other banks. And if that bank were to close, would have a significant negative impact 
on those small borrowers and, and bank depositors in that community. And so there are sometimes things to think about um, those collateral consequences that cause you to, to um, want to be less harsh perhaps on a corporate entity because it will harm other people who um, by no wrongdoing of their own are going to see some harsh consequences as a result. All right, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Barb. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this question is from Bob. Um, we, uh, we heard the IRS come up a couple times. How much does the lack of IRS enforcement of tax laws for the rich come into play here? I'm gonna say something quickly and then um, let, let uh, Jesse speak because at ProPublica, he and others did some incredible work that I, I reference in the book. Um, the IRS budget has been slashed. You know, I think the, the I, I, there's a, the name of the, um, I think he calls it the gutting of the IRS, some of these pieces, these articles. And it's like, it's like a couple, either two or $3 billion less in terms of a budget in the last decade. Around 30,000 fewer employees, there are fewer audits. And the priorities, um, you know, we hear this before, it's the low-hanging fruit. If you make $20,000 or less a year, you're just as likely to be audited today if you're in the top 1%. I'm gonna hand it over to Jesse now because he's done, he actually did the investigative work and I'm sure he has a lot to say. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, the IRS is one of these reclamation projects that uh, I was referring to earlier, um, maybe the great reclamation project. Um, and as you say, today in America, you're more likely to be audited if you are one of the working poor than if you make about four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars a year. The audit rate uh, for the richest uh, Americans and the largest corporations have completely collapsed. Tens of thousands of employees have left, billions of dollars have been stripped out of the budget, and we should be clear that this was largely a Republican uh, effort um, that started in 2010 uh, to strip the IRS of its budget with a kind of, um, uh, kind of tacit acceptance from the Democratic, uh, you know, Democrats in Congress and the Obama um, uh, uh, White House and the Obama administration. And um, what, what has happened here is the audit rates have collapsed, um, audits of wealthy individuals have collapsed, audits of corporations have collapsed, as I just said, and then prosecutions of tax fraud have almost literally gone away. Um, and that's a kind of very strange uh, thing to get your head around, but really what's happened is the IRS, which used to be a formidable prosecutorial aid, um, the investigative arm of the DOJ for tax fraud, really has started to refocus over the last 10 years to attach itself to other existing crimes. Like if you're charged with drug dealing or money laundering, then you have this, uh, uh, they, the IRS comes in and attaches a um, tax fraud charge to that, and it, it um, so the few people that they actually do prosecute, you get a higher sentence, what I was kind of referring to earlier. What we don't do in this country anymore, um, almost, uh, you know, literally zero, but it's not literally zero, but it's a very, it's collapsed, is prosecute people who have legal income, but then cheat on their taxes, um, uh, which, you know, you could imagine uh, somebody in, commercial real estate in uh, New York who uh, goes on television and has a, a series of aggressive write-offs and maybe has a bunch of LLCs um, and uh, gets a lot of, of uh, aggressive depreciation and then uh, tries to reduce the amount of expenses um, or you know increase the amount of expenses and reduce the taxes. You could Jesse, you can say his name. Like that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we know that the, uh, we, I think it's been definitively proven that we have a, uh, a, the product of a tax cheat and a decades long tax cheat in the White House today. Um, and a guy who actually has been under audit for uh, not necessarily criminal um, tax cheating in this particular case that he's been under audit, but certainly um, for uh, the kind of evasion that the tax uh, administration, the IRS, might 
actually investigate if it were fully funded. Um, Donald Trump uh, is a tax chief, and um, and he's not alone, um, but he's a particularly aggressive uh, and uh, malign sort. And so, tax cheating is the way to go after the wealthy. Um, it is the way to increase uh, our fisc, um, and we uh, should try to increase the budget of the IRS. And also, it's not just the budget, it's a skill set um, issue and a recruitment issue and a kind of reclamation, not just of the resources, but also of the position of the civil service in American society. We need to uh, reclaim that and uh, have it be prestigious and have it be a valuable career, something that people stay in for um, their whole lives and do good. Um, and uh, and I think that's the kind of project that we need. Um, uh, again, I'm very pessimistic about whether we can achieve it. And I'm optimistic because I think we can take those steps. I'm just I'm waiting for January of 2021. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone. Um, many thanks to Jennifer and to our panel and to you, our audience. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this type of important programming during these times. So please continue to support Jennifer Taub and Politics and Prose by following the link in the chat to purchase Big Dirty Money. Um, if I say so myself, I think a purchase supports the idea of justice in general. So many thanks again to you all. Um, for more PNP Live, you can check out our website for a full calendar of updated event listings. Just take your pick. It's going to be an exciting fall. Um, a final round of thanks to everybody here and for you and to you for joining us today. Um, from all of us here at Politics and Prose, we want you to stay strong, stay safe, and stay well read. We'll see you next time. <laughs>